Thanks, Murphy, and thanks, everybody, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, and to join this group. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about really a horticultural project and one that involves plant exploration, but very focused in uh, one small region. So just to give you a little introduction to the Morris Arboretum, we uh, were an estate. John and Lydia Morris moved there in the 1880s. They were siblings who never married, and they developed the garden. They were plant collectors and, and collectors of all sorts of things, and including garden features. So we have uh, the bones of the wonderful uh, Victorian garden, and within that we integrate our living collections. So it's really merging uh, both this garden and collections in uh, a very uh, hopefully a uh, beneficial way. So we're known for our uh, large uh, tree collection. Philadelphia is a very uh, favorable climate in which to grow trees, and so we're known for, for large trees and other, other genera. And I know I maybe shouldn't say that in this meeting, but um, uh, some of my other interests and in our other collections include witch hazels, um, magnolias, and for those of you in the Magnolia Society, it'll be meeting in Philadelphia next year. Uh, maples, um, and then of course oaks. And I just have some slides of some large old trees. We have a very dynamic collection, so if you look at the age structure of our oak collection, it's, it's pretty even actually. So we have trees that predate uh, the Morris's moving there, like this nice old uh, white oak. Uh, Quirk is bender eye, and I'm, I'm a little sad to say that about a quarter of this tree broke out this uh, summer, but it's we're looking at propping it and keeping it going. Uh, and then other things that were planted by the Morrises and ever since there, like this nice uh, uh, red oak, Quercus rubra. So um, why do we, I want to talk a little bit about plant exploration. And, and these are the reasons we go uh, plant collecting. And the one I want to focus on ex is extending hardiness and increasing vigor. So about in the late 1970s or so, we developed this target map around the world of uh, climatic analogs, places where we could go collecting that had a climate similar, similar to uh, Philadelphia. You can see it's basically everything uh, east of the Mississippi, central China going up into Manchuria, Korea, and Japan, and then uh, the Balkans and the Caucasus. And these are the trips we've gone on. And it's a little easier to see graphically. Uh, so the purple areas are still shaded, the original targets, and the pins are where we've gone. And this slide is a couple years old, so there's a few more pins. But over the years, we've really um, you know, approached and, and successfully um, visited those areas that we've targeted. So one of the ideas I had a few years ago was uh, to look at Quercus virginiana, live oak. And um, it's funny that this is a tree that really uh, is not grown very much outside of its hardiness zone or, or its native range. Unlike other things like uh, Magnolia, Virgi uh, Magnolia grandiflora, which has a, a southern range, but you can find it growing in, in Philadelphia and New York, uh, and, and a little bit further north than its native range. Um, Quercus virginiana is not like that. So here's its range, the, um, the light green, um, um, counties are highlighted, and it does get up into Virginia. So the idea on this trip was to visit the northern limit of its range in Virginia and look at both cultivated plants and uh, natural populations at the northern limit of the range, grow them on, and see if they will survive outside in Philadelphia and, and even Boston. I went with a colleague from um, from the Arnold Arboretum. So here are uh, here's another map showing the uh, native uh, locations of Quercus virginiana. And we visited um, sites down in this area right here. We did not have time to visit these, so that's sort of phase two of this trip. And the other phase I should mention of this trip, which is to try and get into these populations as well. So really we're looking at kind of a two-phased uh, approach to this in terms of collecting. So. Uh, where we went, uh, we, as I said, we wanted to find the most inland cultivated plants. Uh, and since doing this trip, and I'm sure this group will tell me as well, people say, oh, no, 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 I know of trees that are in a much colder place than that, So, which is great. I mean, I'd like to know that if anyone does know that and, and visit those trees as well. So we started in Richmond, which is a very similar zone, hardiness zone to Philadelphia. Perhaps slightly warmer, but very comparable to Philadelphia. So we collected there. Uh, moved to um, Williamsburg uh, and William and Mary College, which is right straddles the James River, which is really the limit of Quercus virginiana. 
and then down to Hampton and Virginia Beach. So the timing of this trip was uh, pretty exquisite. We actually were there the week before Hurricane Sandy occurred. So one week later, and we would have been hightailing it home. Um, so as I said, I traveled with a good friend, Michael Dosman, who's the curator at the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. And uh, for those of you who don't know Live Oak, here it is. Um, uh, a plant that both of Michael and I are northerners. Michael's from Indiana, I'm from Pennsylvania. So we actually don't, didn't know this plant very well at all. And uh, as I said, we started in Richmond. We visited uh, one of the large city parks, which had been in the state, uh, had been a Civil War uh, um, hospital, and has uh, a collection that was started largely in the early 1900s. So, Again, we're looking at a climate very similar to ours. Here's, there were a couple of large live oaks there. Here's, uh, here's one for scale. We presume these were planted in the, around 1910 or so, and there had been some cold winters in uh, Virginia. We looked at some of the records, and there were temperatures down to minus 20 Celsius in the, in the um, 40s. So these trees have survived some cold winters, so we, we knew that. Um, and they were uh, very typical of the um, of the species, and maybe not as grand as you might find further south, but still significant trees. And I should say that um, uh, Richmond is really the limit of where you see live oak cultivated. If you get to Washington, D.C., you might see a couple plants here and there, but you really don't. So as I said, uh, there's really a, a limit, more or less based on the natural range of where you see this plant cultivated. So we're trying to extend that. So just to give you an idea of the scale of uh, what we were looking at uh, for the, from the two trees that we collected. And they become these, these very broad, uh, wonderful trees as they age with lots and lots of character. So from there, we uh, moved down to, as I said, um, College of William and Mary, which is in Williamsburg. And these trees uh, have been there for some time, probably since the, the 20s or 30s. It's not really clear where they came from. Uh, presumably, they were collected locally because the, the native range is very close to uh, Williamsburg and, and William and Mary. So we made a number of collections on campus. And, and the campus of College of William and Mary abuts to Colonial Williamsburg, the, the tourist area. So we collected in both locations there. And a number, as I said, we made a number of collections on campus, presumably, as I said, of uh, local provenance, and then likewise in uh, Colonial Williamsburg uh, itself, collecting there. So as we were there, uh, we were seeing folks uh, really engaged with the trees, which was, uh, as someone who runs an arboretum, it's a little bit terrifying sometimes, but it's also nice. As a father, it's nice to see children actually enjoying the trees as well. Um, and as we're walking around, uh, uh, Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg, we saw this really impressive specimen and, and sort of wondered what this was. We thought it was a big live oak, and as we got closer to it, um, we realized it was Quercus comptonii, uh, the Compton oak, the hybrid of um, Lyrata and um, Virginiana. So a very interesting plant, and um, one that we were not um, familiar with, again, being northerners, not very familiar with it. Um, but there's a, a connection to the Arnold Arboretum. This was named by Sargent in the early 1900s. Um, so Michael was very excited about that. From there, we um, moved down to the Hampton and Virginia Beach area. Um, and we visited uh, a place called Fort Monroe, which is in Hampton which is the largest fort uh, in the United States. There was a whole series of fortifications along the coast in the early 1800s. And it's a fascinating place, both ecologically and historically. So uh, I'll show you a few slides of it. And one of the, the historical uh, ironies of it is that it was completed in the 1830s. And the uh, engineer and lieutenant who was in charge of the completion was Robert E. Lee, the uh, later general of the um, Civil War. Um, of, the, of the Confederacy. So just to give you a sense of the, the massiveness of this uh, fort. Uh, the, the other sort of interesting fact about it is that it never surrendered. It's in Virginia. It never surrendered during the um, uh, Civil War, American Civil War. So it remained um, US territory during uh, the Civil War, uh, surrounded by the Confederacy. And as a result, it was a place where, where slaves could go and seek asylum. So it became a place where some, one of the first places where slaves were able to uh, seek asylum uh, in the fort. Um, 
So there's a long history of that. But what was interesting there was the uh, population of old live oaks within the fort that had been preserved. So it's thought to be that these are perhaps, some of these may be a couple hundred years old and, and certainly predate the fort. So there are several dozen of these uh, very old, impressive trees in the, uh, within the fort, in the grounds. And we also noticed that these were preserved near the officers' quarters and in the barracks there were no live oaks at all. So um, you see who got the nice shade. Um, so we, we were not able to collect here. It's a very complicated um, ownership of the fort owned both by the US Park Service and by the state of Virginia. So uh, there was some complications in being able to collect anything other than herbarium specimens. And also, um, while we hit the acorn production spot on for everything else, for some reason at Fort Monroe, we had missed it. And I think it's a little microclimate in there and the acorns had passed and the uh, squirrels had probably eaten them all. But really uh, impressive, uh, remarkable, um, uh, old uh, population within the uh, fort walls, including the uh, Algernon Oak, which is thought to be the oldest live oak in uh, Virginia, and certainly at this site, uh, a massive, uh, impressive live oak. And just to give you a sense of it, um, this, here, we, here I am with the Algernon Oak. So um, just a couple, uh, another slide of, of the collection or the population in there inside the fort. So finally we went to a uh, very interesting state park uh, in Virginia Beach called First Landing State Park. It's a fascinating place. There are, uh, here it is from Google Maps. There are seven ecological zones within this park, not a very big park. Everything from uh, bald cypress swamps uh, to uh, coastal vegetation here. And I'll show you slides of both what we saw in uh, sort of more inland and then on the dune, on either side of the dunes here. Um, so start, uh, just a shot of the dunes and then going into the uh, bald cypress swamp. It happens to be the uh, northern limit of the range of uh, Spanish moss, Tillandsia. Uh, we, we didn't make a collection of that. It would have been nice to do that. But we were collecting some other things while we were there, including uh, Persia palustris, uh, an evergreen member of the um, Laurel family, which may or may not be hardy for us, but again, we're, it's the northern limit of its range and, and worth testing. And then um, uh, Cheinanthus, uh, uh, this is another shot of the, the Persia. And then, um, sorry, uh, let me back up for a second. Cheinanthus americanus, sorry, I got these backwards. Cheinanthus americanus, uh, devil wood. Um, Again, at the northern limit of its range, which we also want to test for hardiness. And then um, Persia palustris, the um, uh, uh, member of the laurel family. So from uh, the, this very wet uh, site, we then move to the dune uh, area. And in this slide, um, you, here's Michael. This is Quercus virginiana and then Quercus incana, which um, growing next to each other, which Paul mentioned um, the other day in his, Paul Manos in his talk the other day. So here they are um, growing side by side. Um, very nice study of a um, red oak group and uh, Varentes growing in the same ecology here. And you have the um, incana fruits along with the uh, Virginiana um, there side by side. So what we collected um, was from this large natural population. Uh, there was, they were integrated with the dunes and the picnic area, so it was a very lovely autumn day to collect. Not uh, here, not growing nearly as large as in uh, Fort Monroe, certainly stunted by the uh, dune ecology in this location. Uh, but uh, I suspect that these are clonally growing and that these are very, very old trees based on um, where they are and um, how they're growing. So from that, we made somewhere around 12 seed collections. As I said, this transect from cultivated plants in Richmond down to this natural population in, um, uh, along the coast in Virginia Beach. We've had great germination. We made a major distribution to many members of the NAPCC oak group. So not only are we growing these, but we've sent them further south and further north. So we were able to um, spread what we can, uh, you know, spread the wealth, so to speak. And we've been um, 
growing these on. They've now had three, this will be their third winter. We're growing them in two different growing conditions indoors. And next spring we plan to plant them out and just see what happens. We probably have 200 or 300 seedlings way more than we could ever use. So we're hoping to see, even if we see a half a dozen or so that survive, uh, that's fine for us. So we're growing them in a, uh, we've overwintered them in two different conditions. We have a pit house, which we heat to around just above freezing. Uh, so it, it may get to zero centigrade, but it, it's kept right there. And then we have a, a poly house, which we keep to about 28, 26 um, Fahrenheit, so one or two below uh, um, zero centigrade. And after last winter, which was fairly cold, we did see some um, mortality, you can see in here, and certainly some dieback on, on some of the trees. We started to analyze this a little bit. And hopefully by the next uh, symposium, I'll have, we'll have planted these out and I'll have some results and uh, we'll have some trees that have survived as well. So um, that's where we are with this project in a, in a nutshell. And perhaps someday when you visit the Morris Arboretum, you'll drive through an alley of live oaks uh, rather than magnolias. It's, that's my dream. <laughs>